Thank you, and thank you, the St. Andrews Bukoto ladies, uh, for that singing, also for the reading of the text. And so, since time is first spent, allow me to pray right away, and then we begin. Father, thank you so much for this time, and thank you for your word. You are pleased to speak to us. And so give me clarity and expression of the word. Give me a listening ear to the Holy Spirit that as he speaks, so I will speak. And help each one of us to decrease that only you shall increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, uh, it's a joy once again to be able to share with you, and today I was given a topic coming out of that text, overcoming the spirit of rejection. And if I may, if you've never been rejected or somehow treated like you don't matter, just wait. It will come to you. You may be rejected because of your Christian lifestyle, which is opposed to the world of sin. Someone even said that if you never meet any opposition to your life, then you better watch the direction you're walking. Because if you're walking against sin, you certainly will meet resistance. Or you may be betrayed by a trusted friend or rejected for what you have or you look like. Some people don't like others simply because of the complexion of their skin or the way that they look. But you must not consider this rejection to be on yourself. You must not invite, invite it for yourself. Now in the passage that was given to us, which is the fourth song of what is called the servant songs, it's the fourth and the last, it talks about the redeeming work of the servant of the Lord, whom we know now to be Jesus Christ. Now, what we are going to be dwelling on, we want to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and his own rejection and the exemplary uh, conduct that he has for us. And then, of course, I'll be concluding just to see how we ourselves are called upon to respond to rejection when it comes our way. But like I said, Christians are not called to invite rejection toward themselves. You need to be mindful that God called you to a holy life, and that holy life is contrary anyway to what is happening in the world, and inevitably you will be rejected by the world or sometimes by even the people around you. Now as we look at the life of Jesus, I don't know how many of you have had opportunity to read a book called In His Steps. If you've never read it, it's a small book by Charles Sheldon, written really more than a century ago, I would say, but a very remarkable book in the sense that it calls us to emulate what Jesus did and how he lived. That book actually centers on a verse in 1 Peter 2.21, which says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And that book calls upon us as Christians, which is exactly what should be our vocation. That for each decision or act that you take, you ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Now, in the recent past, I've seen a number of people wear little armbands with the initials WWJD. Uh, sometimes I wonder if they know where that came from, but it comes from that book. What would Jesus do? 
Now in the passage that we read, first and foremost, I want us to look at the identity of the servant of the Lord who was rejected. Because I believe very strongly that if we are to understand how we shall overcome the spirit of rejection, it requires us to understand and to have a keener look on the Lord Jesus Christ and how he handled it. Then ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And therefore act similarly. Now, when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 53 of Isaiah, you even wonder if this was indeed the creator of the world that we later get to understand, particularly in the New Testament, as it is revealed, that Jesus was God. In this day and age, I think it is important to ask the question, if any of us were asked that God was going to appear, what would be your perception of God or of his servant who has come directly from the throne of God? Now, that is a question that I believe even the Jews struggled with as Jesus appeared. And what Isaiah said centuries before was fulfilled in the way that they received the Lord Jesus Christ when he appeared. Obviously, many people would have expected he must start from Jerusalem. And he should be able, if it is in our day, he should be able to build a mega church. I hear people fundraising for mega churches and taking every penny from the poor. Or maybe it should be someone who is likable. Someone who will work miracles. No wonder today, the pastor who talks most about miracles attracts the largest crowd. Whether the miracles are authentic or not, or even existent. We would expect that an emissary of the Lord would be invincible, undefeatable. He would be believable, and more and more we could say about it. But how did Jesus come? He came as a reject. And that's what Isaiah places before us. Contrary to the expectations of everyone, Jesus appeared as one who was rejected. First and foremost, in verse 2, we are told, that he grew up such an ordinary child, so ordinary that people would pass by him. They would not even glance again to see what kind of person is this. He was very ordinary, just like you and me. Very ordinary. They saw nothing divine in him. You remember that the Jews themselves, when they saw the Lord Jesus Christ, they would say, isn't this the son of Joseph? And unto these, his brothers and sisters amongst us, he had nothing about him to announce his divinity, to announce his royalty, to announce even his desirability. Jesus was uncharismatic, if you wish. Unlike many of the, a lot of the flamboyance that we see in those who call themselves the man of God as we hear often these days. He was not the kind of person that people longed to associate with. Listen to verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, if you want to associate with anyone, you do not look for a person who has been rejected. You do not look for a person who is sorrowful and acquainted with the grief. We all want to associate with the kind of person who will cheer up our life, who will lift us up, who will make things better, who will be safe to be around. Well, that was not the Jesus that came. Jesus came as a reject. He did not even commend himself by his appearance. 
If we just glance back to chapter 52, verse 14, because this passage actually begins at verse 13 and right through chapter 53. It says, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. That is the savior we are talking about. That the servant of the Lord when he eventually appeared among the Jews, they beat him to a pulp, into a bleeding pulp, such that he became a mass of hopelessness. Not as one from God. Is this the kind of God you would be expecting? Possibly not. When we are expecting God to appear or his servant to appear as he was being announced by the prophets, we would be expecting flamboyance, we would be expecting victory. But that's not the servant of the Lord that we see in Jesus. To make it worse, we are told in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 53 that even human courts, and we know that of course happened in the New Testament, the human courts condemned the servant of the Lord. For he says here, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. He suffered the same kind of oppression that we ourselves suffer. He suffered the rejection that we ourselves suffer from others. He was judged wrongly. So the justs of human courts could not acquit him. Jesus was also oppressed, like maybe some of you even feel today. And as if that were not enough, when we move from the human side and we look at how God treated him, what do we read in verse 4? He was forsaken by his father, rejected by God. Listen, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That is the Jesus we are looking at. He was truly rejected. No wonder he cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For at that particular moment, even his own father forsook him. And he saw him on the cross. But what he was seeing there is your sin and my sin. Our wickedness is what he looked at. And the God we are talking about, as he says in Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, he says that he is of purer eyes than to look at evil. So he could not look at Jesus in the wickedness of man. Jesus. This is the man that is presented to us. Friends, time would fail me to say more and more about the rejection that Jesus suffered for you and for me. And why did he suffer all this? He was innocent. He had done absolutely nothing. Indeed, he was rejected, as we know, in the trial that happened later without any conviction. He was crucified without a case against him. Peter goes as far as to say, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, 23, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He who is God and could have called down angels to punish these people, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Rejection, betrayal, slandered, persecution. What didn't Jesus suffer? And he suffered all these not because he had a case to answer, not because any, even a human court had condemned him. Indeed, the only court that eventually convicted him was the heavenly court because of your sin and my sin. That's all. Rejected. You see, friends, even as we walk in this world, 
We too may be innocent of some of the things that are said about us, that are done about us. There are countries, and even in our society, you may find that your faith is enough crime when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That alone becomes an offense. And so in the hymn, in Christ alone, which I believe many of you are familiar with, the two authors, Stuart Townsend and Keith Getty, they sang these words about Jesus. They said he was scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. He who had no sin was rejected for the sin of others. For my sin and for your sin. And all he could do at a moment like that was to entrust himself to God who is just. Now you may wonder how he could entrust himself to the same God that had rejected him. But we know that this God is one who wounds and also heals. There comes a time in moments of rejection, in moments of being slandered, and you cannot even explain why you are slandered. There comes those moments when you wonder, where shall I turn? The only place to turn is to the one who wounds and also heals. For the human courts, when they wound, they don't heal. When people wound, they don't heal. But the God to whom Jesus entrusted himself is one who wounds and he also heals. The Bible is very clear. Even here in Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord was without sin. What happened in verse 6 is that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He laid on him our sins, my brothers and sisters. There was a song long ago, probably many of you will not know. It was in an album called The Witness. And the main singer in it was called Pat Boone. I don't know if he still lives. But that song had a line, we did not know that this was God, the Father's Son. He was rejected, and even those that rejected him, they thought that by calling himself the Father's Son, he was blaspheming. But Jesus was innocent. He did not deserve rejection. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was reviled. He was, and he did not revile in return. He suffered what we deserved, wounded for our transgressions. That's what he says here in verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Those nails that went through his hands, they did not go through his hands because of his sin, because of his crime, because he was convicted. They went through because of my sin and your sin, because he was convicted for my sin, so he was pierced. That's why the cross is the central thing about Christianity. If you preach anything without the cross of Jesus, you have no gospel. And imagine, this Jesus had the power to call upon the angelic army for rescue. Did he himself say, when Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, don't you know that I could call upon angels to come and rescue me? Yet, because he came for you and for me, if he had not died, you and I would die in our rejection. And the worst rejection we would suffer is the rejection that God rejected him in. So he did not call them. He was not the kind to flaunt to boast 
about who he was. He allowed himself, friends, he allowed himself to be nailed, not because he was powerless. He who had raised the dead, he who had healed the sick, he who had opened the eyes of the blind, he who had opened the mouths of the dumb and the deaf ears had been opened, He's, he was there helpless, rejected by you and by me. That's what Isaiah was reflecting on. We like to, when we are big, we like to flaunt who we are. I remember even one man who asked me one time, do you know who I am? And in that particular situation, he wanted to show that he was higher than me. This Jesus who was higher than us, he understood that at a moment of rejection, you defeat it by humility, by innocence. By repentance of sin. That's what it should be. And so by his rejection. Isaiah tells us in verses 4 to 6. You and I like Barabbas. Walked free. Not because we deserved to be free. It was simply that the, what Jesus did on the cross sufficed, sufficed to turn away the rejection that with God had rejected us and put it on his son. Peter summarizes our benefit in Jesus' death. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, let me read it for you very quickly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep. He echoes the language of Isaiah. You were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus suffered our punishment, friends. Jesus accepted to be rejected in our place. He was rejected by men. He was rejected by God. But the most painful for him that he cried out on the cross was the rejection of God. You and I were rejects. Even if we were not rejected by our families, even if we were not rejected by our friends, we were rejected by the Father. That is the worst rejection. And you know, friends, this Jesus that we are talking about, because of his rejection, we have been embraced in God's arms. He was forsaken so that you and I could be welcomed. And at the cross, Jesus the reject cried out, to the Father, so that you and I would not be rejected. Forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And listen, we must not consider that what the Jews did is distant from our own hearts. For when we hold on to sin, when we do not repent of sin, we ourselves are saying, I want to hold on to it, I still want my sin. But remember, he suffered grief. He suffered sorrow that you may go free. And when he was on the cross, rejected by the Jews, as he would have been rejected even today, he said, forgive them, forgive them. And he teaches us there what to do when we are rejected. That when we hold on to the rejection in our hearts, we only hurt ourselves. You don't hurt anybody else. It's you who suffers at the cross. God displays his love supremely. Friends, we must always remember the cross is God's supreme display of his welcoming love. His bleeding love, as Festo used to call it. 
As John tells us in John 3.16, a verse that we know so well, for God so loved the world, so loved. He does not say God loved the world very much. He says so loved because the depth of that love is impossible for us to fathom. In his rejection, God was saying to you, you are accepted without any further conditions. You are accepted. You don't need to feel like a reject. Within your spirit, be free. For I have set you free at the cross of Jesus. And if there is rejection by others, it is inconsequential. For the rejection of others cannot hold your life, cannot even give you a destiny. Let go. Forgive them. Forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. It hurts to suffer innocently. And Jesus suffered innocently. But he suffered for my sin and your sin. That we too may be able to say to others, I forgive you. So his rejection then whispers God's forgiveness, friends, to us. He was rejected and crucified by our sin. The cross of the servant was God's righteous judgment for us. And so we can experience forgiveness. And let me just say this one last thing here. Maybe a couple of things. First of all, that when God takes over our life, he says, forgiven. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse, 20, verse, verse 1, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. No condemnation. No case to answer. That's what it means. You are quitted. The judges of the earth say, not guilty. God says, innocent, because everything that would convict you has been placed on Jesus. And so for others that reject, he says, let's put that rejection at the foot of the cross. Friends, the servant of the Lord, when he died on the cross, did not lift merely the symptoms of rejection. Many of us prefer to take the symptoms of rejection. And what I mean by this, many of us have come to Christ to take their our poverty, to take their our ill health. Those are merely symptoms of rejection. But there is a worse rejection. And that rejection dwells in the heart. It's because of sin. Now let me ask you, my brothers and sisters, do not have a tug of war with God. When God says, give me your sin, do not say, I still want to enjoy a little more. Don't have a tug of war, a tug of war with God. This Jesus who died on the cross, is one who goes deep down in the heart and he takes out the jigger of sin and takes it away. So to overcome rejection, leave it in his mighty hands. Do not dwell on rejection by people. Jesus himself said, do not fear these people who after they have killed can do nothing. But fear him who after he has taken this life can also throw you into hell. The servant king suffered rejection. He was rejected by man. He was rejected by God so that you and I would be accepted. And when you recognize that, the no rejection can take you away from him. No other rejection matters anymore. May God give you the grace to understand that there is one that has lifted our rejection. There is one who has given us an example of how to live. May we be willing also to take our rejection 
and laid at the foot of the cross. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Because when we look at the cross, we see the victory we never deserved. We see the forgiveness that should not have been ours. We see your flowing love in the blood of Jesus. And we should have been the ones to die on that cross. People may reject us. But let not that, let's not work to be popular or famous. But that we may look to Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.